Thank you for joining us today, the webinar. Today we have Catherine from Pathfinder, and of course myself, Alfred Ip, I'm the hero in it. Um, today we're talking about, what are we talking about today? We're talking about the new campaign that we're joining hands together to launch. Perfect. Tell um, us more about the new campaign. Well, let me first just uh, start with introducing myself. Absolutely. And then people might want to know a little bit more about you too, Absolutely. Alfred. So okay. um, I'm Catherine. I'm yeah. the CEO of Pathfinders. I've been with Pathfinders for three years. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been working on child rights and child protection across mm -hmm. Asia for um, over a decade now. Mm -hmm. um, I was previously with Save the Children. And so uh, the sense of kind of protecting children for me is, 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 a, is a huge passion. Children is a core cool thing for you yes throughout your career um, well, prior to prior to the NGO sector, I worked yeah. um, in the pharmaceutical industry um, on public affairs and communications. Ah. So quite different. Um, but yeah, the last decade has been very much committed to children, and that's why I was driven to Pathfinders because mm. um, Pathfinders exists to protect some of the most vulnerable and unsupported children in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, and we also work to empower their mothers, mm -hmm. um, typically migrant domestic workers, current or former, uh, to find a path to a brighter future for the children. Okay. Um, and can you tell us more about, um, I think children of the unprivileged class are often overlooked. Um, Hong Kong has always been perceived as a very wealthy city. People always go down the street dressed um, um, brightly and uh, they, they, there seems to be no poverty issue. Yeah. In your experience, can you tell us more about um, what sort of difficulties they are facing? Is it the living zone problem or what sort of problem? I think um, with the migrant domestic worker community that we serve, the, the challenge is often sort of respect and value for the contribution that they make to Hong Kong. Um, of the so, uh, domestic helper? Domestic helper, oh, yes. Yeah. They're so important to Hong Kong. They, they are, um, and, and they contribute a huge amount. Um, and, you know, empower working mums like myself to be able to work too mm -hmm. um, but often when they become pregnant themselves and they're yeah. wanting to have a family they find themselves in a situation where they're either forced to resign or they choose to resign because they don't know what their maternity rights are mm. um, and at that point um, if they are too scared to go home because mm. they're here as the brethren and more often than not for their families yeah. then they they overstay in Hong Kong mm. and go underground and and mm. that's why this particular campaign for mm. us is, is is really powerful because as part of our crisis intervention services, we focus on um, the nurturing care framework. And one of the key components of that is safety and security and mm -hmm. making sure that the child is protected and safeguarded. Mm -hmm. um, and for us, we look at things like birth certificates. Um, yeah. But when we came, you came to us and we had this conversation mm -hmm. about doing a joint campaign, we were really interested in the sense of deeds of guardianship because mm -hmm. that, again, is another important way to mm -hmm. protect and safeguard children in times of uncertainty, in times of crisis. Absolutely. Um, before we go on, um, I want to know a little bit more about um, the reason things that you have been doing. Mm -hmm. I was told that actually during COVID, um, there were a lot of domestic helper who were basically terminated the contract because they are infected um, yeah. and they kept keep very busy. Yeah, so um, we, we work as Pathfinders as part of a migrant domestic worker coalition. So mm. we are one of 14 organizations that have come together to serve the community. And actually, we came together first last mm. year yeah. um, because we wanted to do more to drive appreciation and respect for migrant domestic mm. workers. But having that coalition mm. um, recently has proved its weight in gold. Mm. Um, so we first at Pathfinders got a call from Help for Domestic Workers um, in the middle of February to say that they had a couple of workers who... Um, had tested positive, mm. um, were being told by their employers that they couldn't return home, um, and also were being pushed out by the hospital saying mm. that you have to home quarantine, you can't oh. stay here. Mm. Um, Actually, we were contacted because we have a great relationship with Avolo Hotel that provides some level of quarantine, but mm. Avolo, like all hotels in Hong Kong, mm. can only receive cases from the airport. They couldn't mm. receive from the community. So mm. um, at Pathfinders, while it's not our core mission, we did operate as a first responder to mm. use our emergency shelter to give uh, give space to these ladies to, um, so they weren't sleeping on the street. I mean, one of them had already been on the street for a couple of days sleeping wow. in a park. So it was a very, um, it was a very dire circumstance. Again, you know, not wanting to judge the employers. You know, if they have elderly parents at home who are not vaccinated, we, we completely understand it's a difficult situation. But as an employer, when you employ a migrant domestic worker, you take on a duty of care. Absolutely. Um, and so really, um, 
despite it being difficult, employers absolutely should be going to all lengths to make sure that they're protecting their workers and, and caring for their workers, as, as many of those workers care for us and our families in Hong Kong. I cannot agree with you more. Um, this shows NGO like your um, organization are really at the forefront of protecting to um, people, including children or the rest of worker or the unprivileged class at the time when they really need it. Yeah, and I think that's the value of having a vibrant NGO sector is to be able to step in and support and bridge gaps when those gaps emerge. I mean, it's not to say that the government weren't trying hard to find a solution, but it often takes time to find the space to make sure that the space for quarantine is 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 um, is staffed and manned. But you know, there was a good period of time for seven, eight, nine days where these ladies had nowhere to go, yeah. um, and it was very challenging for us too because you know many of the hotels. We, we went to university dormitories mm. and they were like, oh, well, we, we have space, but we've, we've, we've passed it to the government. Or we were going to some of the big corporates that have, yeah. um, em, you know, have holiday houses for their employees, but mm. again, without clear guidance or regulation, they yeah. weren't able to help. So it was, um, it was a pretty desperate situation. But I think you know, that's where the NGO community adds so much value to, an organi- to a country like Hong Kong, particularly if we can partner and work closely with the government to help bridge gaps as, as things emerge that are potentially unforeseen. Absolutely. Um, a lot of time, I can imagine that when you are doing the work, you face a lot of red tape. The, the things that you mentioned, like, uh, what is the policy? Um, we need to get the approval, bureaucracy. It must be tough. Um, we, we try and see things from a glass half full perspective and we're also very used to challenges. I mean, yes, we have the COVID crisis at the minute, but at Pathfinders, you know, for the last 13 years, the team has been dealing with crisis every day when women and children walk through our doors in need of help. Um, so yes, it can be challenging at times. You know, it's been challenging for so many um, over the last couple of years. Um, you know, I, I took on the role at Pathfinders um, in 2019, just before the social unrest, and then 2020 yeah. we went into COVID. So you know, it's um, the current situation has felt pretty relentless for for many, but particularly for those in the NGO sector. Um, and you know, uh, some of our colleagues from Voice for Social Good recently wrote a letter about the risk of burnout in the NGO sector, and it's and it's a real risk because you know the the situation is ongoing. Um, and you know we can't function as a, as a community, as a sector, without the support of individuals and also corporates <laughs> uh, like Hugel and Nip and, and, and campaigns like this are so valuable. And honestly, on our day-to-day life, when um, we are advising clients, well, for private client lawyers, we deal with um, private client issues all the time. And uh, one of our core practice areas is, of course, family. Mm. And um, the problem that a lot of our clients face is is actually something that um, the current legal system can only do that much to help. Um, for example, um, there are a lot of um, stay-at-home mom with ch- um, young children um, relying on the husband to go to work and feed the family, put food on the table. But one of the major questions that they have when they are facing a divorce situation, for whatever reason they want to get, um, exit from the family, I always say use the word exit, you want to make it more neutral. The one of the pressing issues is, can they survive without the current financial support mm. of the husband? Mm. And a lot of time, husband would use this mm. as a bargaining chip or even as a tool to manipulate those who are relying on them, mm. which is totally uncalled for. Mm. And the issue is, if let's say the husband is refusing to pay maintenance, there are of course ways to enforce the maintenance order. But how long will it take, mm. especially when we are talking about uh, underprivileged who may not be able to afford the high legal fees? And you have to take a lot of effort you know, to cash the husband, mm. especially when they are evading. Mm. Um, the court, if we bring them to court, probably you would be um, hearing the judge um, slamming them with not paying the, the child support, and they would have all the um, excuses. Yeah. But it would take months. Yeah. And before they can go to court, they don't know how, where are they going to find the money to continue putting food on the table. Yeah. yeah. But this is exactly the reason why um, working with NGO is so important for the clients to meet the basic needs. There's that much that we can do as lawyer, uh, but 
There are a lot of um, on the ground thing on day to day issues, relying on people in the forefront like mm. you and your colleagues that are um, in the organization. And there's a very vibrant NGO sector for legal legal supporters as well. I mean, one of the the key organisations that we work with, Equal Justice, helps with some of those concerns for for our migrant mothers, and particularly when it comes to paternity yeah. um, and other and other legal challenges. Yeah. Um, but um, but I'd, I'd love to talk more about deeds of guardianship because as a, as a working mum my, myself, mm. um, I'm really curious about kind of this concept of why it's important to have a deed of guardianship mm-hmm. that's not sort of embedded within a will mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Um, before we go um, to the actual deed of guardianship, mm. perhaps I should tell you more about what we do on yes. that side. Yeah. Um, private client lawyers um, always have to deal with um, the issue of death. Yes. Let's put it this way. Death and tax are the two things that we cannot avoid. <laughs> Joe Black is my favourite movie. He talks about death and taxes, yes. only certainties. Yes, and uh, um, I, I always describe my practice um, consists of three particular areas. Pre-death, during death, and post-death. Okay. A lot of people are quite surprised at what I'm talking about pre-death. We're talking about planning. Um, especially um, when there are families who are um, um, putting together there are issues that um, people have to face when something happens. Um, in the event of um, unfortunate situation, like one, part, or, uh, one parent passed away, or even two parents passed away, mm. who is going to look after the children? And uh, this is where the deed of uh, appointment of guardianship in place. And I will tell you more about this in a little bit. But planning, in terms of will, in terms of advanced health directives or um, the um, enduring power of attorney, these are the common two um, in terms of planning. But all these are coming to one major theme to make sure that in the event of unfortunate situation, people know how to survive. Mm. It is like um, some basic, it's like contingency plan. Mm. A little bit like having an insurance policy to make sure there are enough cash to provide for the family. To, because one of the most horrible things that could happen in a person's life is the sudden loss of family members. Mm. The sudden part cannot be um, emphasized more because sudden. Yeah. You're not planned. Yeah. When you're in a situation like this, you panic. Yeah. You are overwhelmed that you grieve. We're all with fear. Yeah. We're all with uh, uh, anxiety. Yeah. You don't know what to do. And to draw parallels with the, the, the situation or the emotions that our migrant mothers go through when they mm. find out that they're pregnant, because most yeah. of the pregnancies are, are unplanned, yes. it's the same level of stress and anxiety. Because when you don't have a plan and you're not working towards something, that's when a crisis happens. Yes. So again, to your point, talks about the importance of having a clear plan in the eventuality of something happening. Exactly, in the eventuality of something happened, but also to, get to look after something that might happen. Yeah. A lot of people at our age, we don't expect to die soon, to be very no. honest. Yeah. No, we don't, we don't, we hope that we will continue like um, looking after our children, looking after our parents and all this. But, sorry, the Chinese we always have a saying, you cannot plan your death if the God is asking you to come to report to him, you cannot stay for an hour more. And at that moment of crisis, mm. um, really the, the people that you want to sort of um, not suffer mm. are those closest to you and your children. Yeah. So having that sense of plan for the child yeah. more than anything else is, is clear, sounds like it's fundamental. It is. Oh, um, in that respect, I can actually share with you one case. Yeah. I, I still remember there was quite a few years ago we were dealing with um, the probate of um, a, a, a disease. Actually, um, it's a very sad story. Um, he was a pilot. Right. Um, he had a really good income, but he found out that he had cancer. So he decided to um, marry his girlfriend on, the, on his deathbed, literally like days before he passed away. What he didn't know is that probably he wasn't well advised at that time, or he couldn't care. After you married someone, all the wills that you made before will immediately be revoked. Oh, so after okay. he passed away, his estate became intestate. Okay. And what's the issue? You never have fought. Because this newly wed wife, then he had one ex-wife, two other girlfriends, one grown-up child, and, two, um, and another two um, 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 minor children. 
they need to wait for the probate to be issued in or, or the letter of administration in order to have access to the cash that the deceased left behind. Wow, that sounds and, very complicated. <laughs> yes, and we're talking about millions of cash. Yeah. But you ha they, are, they are stuck with the, uh, with the account mm. because um, simply the deceased cannot climb up from six feet under and sign checks. Yeah, and yeah. We were administering the estate and we got calls from on a daily basis from Australia, from Hong Kong, from all these desperate moms who have been relying on the deceased financial support. Yeah. And they call me and say, oh, when are we going to get the money? I've been borrowing, I haven't been able to pay the uh, school fees, the school is, um, um, I'm going to evict my child, when are we going to get the money? It's desperation. And certainly when you have children, I mean, that has to be a core consideration that yeah. you're planning for their future. And certainly at Pathfinders, that's one of the things that we try to do with the, with the mothers, yes. is to really empower them to think about a plan mm. for their child's future that mm. gives them sort of opens up the opportunities for them to thrive. And that's the reason why we're, um, when we are advising parents in terms of what they can do with um, planning for the children, mm. one of the major um, concerns is what happened if both father and mother passed away mm. with, you know, in one incident. Who is going to look after the children? Yeah. And then the, um, the, the advice always make a deed of appointment of guardianship. Yeah. And then the question is, who is going to um, be the guardian? Usually it's going to be the family members, yeah. like um, your sister, her, uh, his sister, or something like that, someone like that. But you have to have someone appointed in order to carry out the guardianship. Otherwise, the family members have to make an application to court. Mm. And uh, the ap application would be um, carefully considered by um, the judge. And uh, if there are more than one person who might be interested, um, the court will make sure that all parties' interest or power party submission will be heard. And that takes time. But what happens to the child in the interim? I mean, the impact on the child of all of these discussions, all of these uncertainties, I mean, that's a point of trauma, particularly if the child is old enough to understand this sense of, 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 of instability. Worst come to work, they, come, they go to a home. Right. But do you want them to go to a home? No. This is exactly the um, day to day life issues that mm. we are talking about. Having someone like a plan B in place to make sure that the children will be well looked after when you are not around is actually very important. And you were saying when we were discussing this sort of earlier yeah. at, the, at the start, yes. when we were kind of coming up with this yeah. campaign, the importance of having sort of a separation between a guardian yeah. and the executor of a will. Yes. Um, again, for that sort of to maintain the best interest of the child through yes. this process. Yes, the, um, the, mo the most important part, as I always say, is not to let your children to become Cinderella. <laughs> okay. The problem with them, um, putting everything on one person is that that person would become the only person to provide for the children. Mm. They could do whatever they want. Mm. They have at least two parties to look after the children together would add as a check and balance. Okay. And that's why um, having a guardian to look after the day-to-day -day of the children's upbringing is great. Yeah. But at the same time, it's better to have someone who, especially someone who can look after money who has the expertise or experience or the knowledge to look after money, can make sure that the money will be applied rightly on the children instead of the guardians or, the, or, or very often the other children of the guardians. Yeah. And uh, having a separate person to look after the money, an independent person in particular, can also make sure that the money can be saved for the children to grow up and inherit. Yeah. A lot of money will be used for the children's um, um, schools, for use, um, children's um, daily, daily lives, um, extracurricular activities, we know how expensive educations are, or even paying for some rent, but then it may not be exhausted by the time the children grow up. So if there's something left behind, that would be great. And so you're sort of guiding, because I know some people look at their will and they mm. say, well, I have provisions made within my will for mm. my children, should I, should I die? So what mm. are the advantages of having a sort of a deed of guardianship that's separate from the will? I always say the best to have these two issues separate. Yeah. Children upbringing, guardianship, um, looking after their daily needs is separate from money. Yeah. Okay. 
the most important um, for this is that the guardian has to exert the, uh, improve their relationship with the children. At the end of the day, they are not on their children's uh, on children's birth certificate. Yeah. To look after them and uh, to, apply, uh, to to prove their relationship with the children, they rely on the deed of appointment of guardianship. Okay. And uh, the problem with having these appointment within the will is that when that person needs to prove the um, relationship, they need to produce the probate. Right. Because the probate process is that the will, original will, will be deposited with court. And the court will issue a document called probate, and uh, in Hong Kong, the probate will have the will uh, certified through copy by the court, together with a list of assets and liabilities. For example, you um, passed away with, you know, uh, with children, you have like 100 million left behind, which consists of properties, cash, um, stocks, and all this. The problem with the guardians going around and show his or her relationship with your children is that with the will, they have to show everything. Mm. So, those who have the guardian will be dealing with, like the school, um, even the, 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 the teachers, or um, even the immigration, they will be not only showing their relationship with the children, but also showing how wealthy the children would be. Yeah. And is it advisable to let the children know that okay don't worry you grow up yeah 100 million waiting for you yeah 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 that's quite a significant risk in terms particularly if they're sort of teenage children and thinking well you know you can't tell me what to do i have you know this this much of an inheritance who you know who are you to me and actually this is something that i go always um, emphasize leaving a windfall to your children um for them to grow up and inherit it's not doing them a favor. Mm. Absolutely not. Because at the time when they grow up and they know that actually money is not an issue, they even learn how to manage the money. Mm. They even learn what, how, how is it to make a living. They never understand and appreciate the value. The value. How hard it is mm. to find it, to, to establish in this brutal society. Mm. Mm-hmm. And to get, I have seen so many. That like second or third generation um, um, wish people, they really do not know how to look after themselves. Mm. They really don't know their um, purpose in life. And this is, it's really doing them a very bad disservice. Mm. Mm. So it's, it's, well, that part would be an extra topic that we can talk about how to talk, plan it properly. Yeah. But the ultimate um, message to show, to show is that it's not right to put the two things together mm. when it will only do much harm to the children. Yeah, including the time it takes for probate, so then the uncertainty and the insecurity for the children in the, Absolutely. In the interim. Absolutely. Um, this, this, um, we are, we're now actually facing on more and more red tapes. We talked about earlier yeah. red tapes. Yeah. A lot of people do like t- take this red tape for granted. Um, just by um, creating hurdles, making, it diff- making things difficult, um, for, for the sake of it, mm. like um, banks, mm. they always ask for all these original documents mm. in order to show um, uh, uh, um, the relationship, um, the wealth, the source of wealth and all this. And to have the probate in place and uh, to show the guardian, it, if you don't have the original, actually it's very difficult to, um, a, a lot of time you have a lot of um, difficulties. Yeah. It's actually um, not very nice these days. Yeah. So yeah. To, we we are talking about uh, paying a few thousand dollars to make things properly. Why don't we just pay uh, doing it properly? Well, I guess it, it, it provides a, se- a sense of security, and you know well, that was one of the reasons why we wanted to do this campaign with you guys yes. because of that sense of giving children that sense and of security. Actually, one more point is that um, we will ask for the guardians to sign. The mm. deed of appointment of guardianship. Mm-hmm. Actually, in a will, you don't, you, you never require the guardians to sign that. But thinking about it is a very important aspect because you are entrusting someone to look after your children when you cannot look after them. Yeah, it's a very, very serious and um, uh, um heavy responsibility. It's huge. You better have the person consent by signing that. Actually, it shows a commitment. 
yeah. of that person towards looking after the most valuable thing, things in your life yeah. when something happened to you. Yeah. Actually, it's, uh, um, um, it's utmost important to make yeah. sure that your children will be well looked after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that clarity. Yes. No, and uh, another thing um, about the deed of appointment guardianship is that apart from the permanent guardian that you, ha um, you can appoint, you also can appoint a temporary guardian. What is it? A lot of people do have the guardian, um, but then the guardian may not be in Hong Kong to look after the children in the event of uncertainty. Mm. Something happened in the, um, all in the sudden, they may not be in Hong Kong to, um, to come and look after the children. And obviously at the minute with COVID and exactly. quarantine and travel restrictions, that's even more of a concern. Exactly. So, um, better to have like a friend um, the, um, um, who have been going out um, to make sure that temporarily the children will be with them. They are not going to be sent to a home. Yeah. People will will be put in a situation that they don't know, oh, can I look after them? Can I take them to, uh, to, go to live with me and things like that? Yeah. They know that they can take the children with them, look out our way until the permanent, comes, or permanent guardian comes over yeah. and pick them up, or even worse come to worse, they bring the children to the permanent guardian and they can show with the deed of appointment of guardianship their relationship with the children, so yeah. there's the child abduction. And we were talking about this earlier because I, I was explaining that, you yeah. know, particularly for my children, they look at our migrant domestic worker as almost like a mm. second mother. So yeah. I was just thinking, you know, is it is it possible to uh, to sort of appoint your worker as as your temporary guardian? But we've it's, talked about the reasons why that's not not appropriate. It's possible, but not yeah. advisable. Yeah. The major reason is that um, the helper, the prevent, um, domestic helper, their contract are with the parents. Yes. When the parent passed away, the contract got terminated immediately. Yes. And they are supposed to leave, I don't, I don't remember, within 14, two weeks, 14, 14, 14 days, days, right? Yeah, two yeah. weeks. What if the permanent guardian cannot come over and pick, up, and pick up the children? And more importantly, can they afford to bring the children to the permanent guardian in case they cannot come and pick up, uh, pick up the children? Yeah. They, they afford to fly so, uh, so far away. Yeah. Do they have the visa yeah. to go to, um, uh, to enter into another country? Yeah. Don't forget, they are all, a lot of times they are from Philippines or Indonesia, Indonesia. that they may, it may not be that easy for them to get a visa yeah. um, to go to another country. Yeah, so these are so, all very good reasons why. Yeah. That, yeah. Have a friend to look after the children just on a temporary basis. And uh, the, um, the helper can always stay behind and help the, uh, the friend looking after the children on a temporary ways basis. Wait until the permanent guardian comes along. So have a proper handover. Let them know what the children are like, or what they like, what they don't like, what they're scared of, and all this. Yeah, and it's interesting because the team at Pathfinders and I were talking about actually the importance with so many migrant domestic workers coming to Hong Kong to work who are mothers too. Yeah. Actually, the importance of them assigning mm. a good guardian for their children that they leave behind in country, again, oh, to yes. look after their, their safety and, and, and security and, and, and well-being. Because obviously many migrant domestic workers as mothers come to Hong Kong to work to give their children a brighter future. Um, but there's increasing evidence that suggests that's not always the case depending on who's taking care of the children. Um, back it is, at home. It is actually, I'm um, thinking about it very sad for mm. them, for those mothers to leave the children behind in their home country and come and after, look after your children. Mm. It's, um, the, the, the sacrifices they're making is it's tremendous. Huge. And it's uh, particularly at times during COVID when they haven't been able to go back to exactly. their, their home country to see their children. Yeah. Um, but it's a sacrifice that many are willing to make because they want to give their children that sense of a brighter future. But I think you know, for us in, in Hong Kong, particularly if those women are then caring for our own children, how can we sort of support them to maintain that, that sort of heart-to-heart -heart connection with, with, with their own children? Yeah, um, um, especially um, Hong Kong, I don't, you haven't been in Hong Kong for so many years. Eight, eight years. Eight years, yeah. but I grew up here, mm. so I know that domestic helpers have been in Hong Kong since the 80s. Yeah, I think it was 40, it's 47 years this year since they've been coming to Hong Kong. Yeah, 47 years. Can you yeah. imagine how many people like us 
were actually brought up by domestic helpers. Yeah, literally, so that the parents can go to work. Yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, they, and that in that respect, they enable many working yeah. mums to work too. I mean, Hong yeah. Kong Baptist University had oh, a had a had a study, and they were basically saying that um, if uh, a family didn't have a migrant domestic worker, the workforce participation by a working mum would be as low as forty nine percent. But given that we have migrant domestic workers, seventy nine percent of working mums are able to engage in in the workforce, and you know in Hong. Kong, Kong, I think we're now down to around 330,000 migrant domestic workers, but we need 600,000 by 2047 to care for an aging population. So we're increasing the reliance on this workforce. Oh, absolutely. Um, who 80% more are women of childbearing age or women who have children at home. So, um, so for us at Pathfinders, that's obviously very important for us to be sort of looking at the sort of safeguarding and, and protection of, of children, both in Hong Kong, but also left in the home country as well. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons why this campaign particularly was so, um, was so um, appealing to us is that you know, one of the key things that we do for, for children um, in Hong Kong born to migrant workers is, is ensure their safety and security by um, making sure they're, they're documented um, and they have a, have a birth certificate. So again, that was just why this particular campaign for us was, um, yeah, was really important to sort of look at the, the protections that are, need to be in place for, for children. I think, think that a lot of people are aware of the importance mm. of a birth certificate. Yeah. And um, the relationship between father, mother and the children. Yeah. And how are they going to be protected under the current legal regime? Um, I, can, I can share with you a little bit more. For example, um, for a man and a woman um, to have a, a child together, um, it sounds like very natural, mm. but there are actually a lot of different aspects of it. The mother and the child uh, actually, mother-child relationship that is always protected under the legal um, current legal system, but the father's right to the child is actually very limited, mm. especially wh when the when the two of them are not married. A lot of people are actually not believing in marriage. Yeah. Modern days, more and more people are not believing in marriage, but they do not, they are not aware of the different rights that um, the father and the mother may have towards the child, and. Uh, while the right of the father to the child may be limited when he's not married to the mother, the responsibility is just as much. Mm. The mother can apply to court asking for child minding fees or other children support if the father can afford. Yeah. So I think a lot of people do not, a lot of mother are not aware of the father's right, but of course. If there is a potential claim as such, for those fathers who are not very responsible, the first thing is to dispute yeah. the, um, the, the relationship. Well, and, and I guess for many of the clients that, that we see at, at Pathfinder, actually the father is no longer in the picture. Um, a lot of the women that, that we see um, actually are, are sort of the pregnancy is a, res a sort of result of a, a love scam yeah. where the, the woman has sort of fallen in love, trusted the guy that she's with. Um, He's given her lots of empty promises about yep. marrying her, um, convincing her that her child born in Hong Kong will be automatically a citizen, and it's not, oh, yes. and it's not true. And then they're gone for dust. So I think that's you know even for our clients, um, being able to com you know, identify or be able to sort of get paternity or any kind of mm. maintenance is, is, mm. is, a, is a real challenge and that's why things like our crisis prevention program that we work with ambassadors to really educate and empower them on, on knowledge about um, love and relationships is, is really important because you know, currently we have 177 migrant domestic workers who we've trained um, in Pathfinders messages and we really want the community to understand more about the risks of falling into relationships without necessarily knowing or having a plan for the future of a child should you get pregnant. They need to know how to protect themselves. Mm. They need to know how to deal with the circumstances when there is limited um, um, promises or assurance to their future livelihood. Mm. And uh, they need to also um, be educated that unless that person is either um, uh, staying here on the um, employment visa or is a permanent um, resident, they cannot stay in Hong Kong with them a dependent visa until they're married to him mm. or her, uh, mm. him. And uh, the problem is that 
Is he going to marry you? Yeah. How are you going to make sure that he's going to marry you? There's yeah. no, there's no such thing as a no ship. guarantees. No yeah. guarantee here, and uh, to uh, don't fall into these empty promises of yeah. how they're going to. Um, or don't you don't think that with um, a baby, she can demand the husband, um, the father, to marry her and give her uh, give her residency here? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now that's why education is so important for the migrant domestic worker community, so that they really don't fall into these 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 um, these traps. But but also so that they understand their rights, maternity rights, so yes. that they can maintain job security. Because one of the kind of the key challenges um, for migrant domestic workers is is you know when they lose their jobs, as you say, they've got two weeks when they have to leave um, leave Hong Kong, and they lose all access to public services, including healthcare. Or well, healthcare is actually very expensive. Well, at, but it's also vital if yeah. you're pregnant with, yeah. a, with a child, um, and yeah. so all of all of these things kind of sort of in, intertwine. It's um, it's a uh, yeah. Yeah, so that is the reason why we have this campaign together. Actually, um, for um clients who can are uh, fortunate enough to um to have um this um family um who can put the, um, money on the table, um to put a little bit of donation, they can directly help um mother. Who are within your um uh, um um categories of um the beneficiary beneficiary? Yeah, and so to that point, you know, the, so the, the the pro bono services that you're providing to create a deed of guardianship is so valuable, and you know, all that people have to do is to make a two thousand eight hundred and eighty eight dollar donation to Pathfinders. Two thousand eight hundred and eighty eight. Yes, <laughs> well, eight 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 so lucky numbers in in, in yeah. Hong Kong. So that was yes. quite that was quite deliberate. But yeah. um, but we're so grateful to 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 Hugolinip for. For, for this campaign, because um, as you say, it kind of uh, enables people to make a donation to Pathfinders that we can maintain and, and, and increase our critical services for many vulnerable mothers and children in Hong Kong. But in re sort of in return to receive this very important document that actually protects their children in the event that something happens to, to them. Can they donate a little bit more? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Of yes. course. I mean, for us, the the COVID the COVID situation has been you know, challenging on 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 numerous levels. Um, not least operationally, we've had to really pivot our services. A lot of what we were doing before was very much face to face, whether it be education classes or, or outreach. Um, and fundamentally, from a fundraising perspective, I mean, every year we would host our annual fundraising dinner, yeah. and that would bring in about. 30% of our annual income yeah. and we haven't been able to do that the last couple of years so this sort of campaign for us is is it's a lifeline to bridge the gap that that's been left by things like our anniversary event actually um, this is something that we can share a little bit more I know, I've heard that so many um, organization who has been relying on donors donation has suffered a lot mm. during this COVID yeah um, a lot of um, uh, um, um, NGO are really um, hanging in there, just because um, there are a lot of um, fundraising events that they cannot organize. Yeah. Um, can you tell us more about um, how it affects the um, the operation of the organization? Well, it was very hard to start with. Obviously, when we knew that we were going to lose thirty percent of our income by not being able to do our anniversary mm. dinner, we had to think quite long and hard about where we could make cuts in terms yeah. of our budget, but also to try and pivot to find different and more diverse income streams for the organisation. I mean, the outpouring of support from the community has been has been very positive, and Pathfinders, fortunately, is in is in a good is in a good position. Um, it could always be better, and it is still very much hand to mouth. Um, but you know, we've we've had to look at different ways to engage um, to engage supporters. Um, typically, we rely heavily on foundations and corporates and our and our anniversary event. Um, increasingly, we're doing more things like this campaigns. Um, we're trying to sort of drive more individual giving, um, and um, and and working with community groups. We've also just recently started doing more work with schools. Um, I guess that's a li little bit linked to our systemic change strategy that really we see students, the youth as the next generation, pioneers for change. Um, but also it's, it's a great way for us to increase education and awareness, but also hopefully sort of some of our income streams as well. But 
as you say, for many in Hong Kong, it's been it's been a really challenging time. Um, it's taken a huge amount of resilience, um, a huge amount of strength, and for us, one of our core values is collaboration. And so we can't um, we can't continue without collaborations like yours um, and with others in the community. It really does um, it really does take a community to uh, to survive and thrive. Actually, um, I'm part of our um, ethnic planning advice. Um, for the privileged individual um, who want to benefit um, some NGO is to say that you can always name a um, NGO or even a charitable cause as a beneficiary. Mm. How is it going on is that um, instead of destinating, of course they would be great to destiny like a pathfinder to be a beneficiary, they can also destinate um, a charitable cause, for example, um, domestic helpers who are um, uh, in critical financial needs or the underprivileged to poverty individuals, they can designate a cause mm. as the beneficiary wow, okay. and, and empower the executor to decide which organization to make the donation to. Yeah. And, and usually the will will also go um, designate how much. So for example, um, if you don't want to designate an amount, you can designate like 10% of the, um, your um, inheritance or uh, estate to go to the bank, a beneficiary um, of this sort. And the executor will then decide which organization to make the donation mm. in order to discharge his or her duty as an executor. Yeah. And uh, um, um, they can decide, instead of one, they can decide more than one. And uh, what if the charitable organization is no longer there when I passed away? The easy answer is don't designate one. Yeah. Designate a charitable organization with a belief of a cause that you believe. Yeah. Like for example, if Pathfinder, um, someone wants to donate but may, may not be necessarily to Pathfinder, what would be the cause that you would excel describe as um um the core um service area that your organization? Well our core focus is children. Children, children of migrant so workers. That would be children um to, so that would be charity um for children and migrant worker. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's our that's kind of our, our niche. There are obviously a lot of organisations in Hong Kong and very good organisations that support yeah. the migrant domestic worker community. Mm. But for us, we're the only organisation that focuses on the very unique needs of children mm. born to migrant mothers. Well, in that case, there's no other organisation there. Just starting part five. That much our job much easier. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, fundamentally, we would love to say that we will we, we'll do ourselves out of a job. I mean, our you know, the, the whole premise of our crisis prevention work is to hopefully remove the, the crisis um, mm. that we see today. That's not to say that pathfinders might not exist in a different way in the future, but we'd love to see um, as, a, as a sort of as a social impact that actually we're not receiving mothers um, in crisis because they've lost their jobs. I mean, for us at Pathfinders, the, the ultimate would be for a migrant domestic worker's pregnancy to be planned, yeah. um, for her to communicate it at, you know, within the first trimester to her employer so they have mm. plenty of time to, oh, yeah. to, to prepare, mm. um, and also for there to be more support or solutions available for the employer mm. to actually help them with some of the financial stress oh, yes. and lack of temporary support solutions that are available as and when their workers go on maternity or any kind of long-term leave. Um, so for us, really, in terms of uh, Pathfinders for Systemic Change, we're trying to do more to, to support the employer too, because when the employer's needs are supported um, and the migrant worker can maintain her job security, fundamentally the child gets a first start. And that's really where, 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 where we're trying to, trying to get to for all children in Hong Kong. Yeah, um, I, I completely agree with you that um, the services that you're providing are absolutely invaluable. I, that reminds me of, because that reminds me of um, one of my friends who are actually treating the son of the domestic helper like their own son. Mm. But mm. not a lot of um, employers in Hong Kong are like that. No, and it's a, it's, a, it's a real mix. I mean, when it comes to sort of pregnancy and, and, and migrant domestic workers, we have seen some incredible employers offering uh, for the child to stay with the mother. 
But that's not the norm, and that's also not the obligation. That's not the expectation. Oh, absolutely um, not at all. But you know, really, for us, it's about trying to ensure that the worker at least maintains her job. Yeah. So that she can continue to access the healthcare services, that she has that 14 weeks of maternity leave to、mm. to create a nurturing bond with her child, to、mm-hmm. prepare a plan for her child to return、yep. to her home country, and then more often than not, these women want to return to work. Oh, in、yes. Hong Kong, because they need to. They, they for many、um, working mothers, where、uh, migrant domestic workers in Hong Kong, they're here earning for their wider, their wider family units.、Um, so yeah, we just we know that there are solutions. We know that we can kind of try and change the kind of、yep. situation as we、mm-hmm. currently see it. So yeah, hopefully Pathfinders won't exist in the same way in the future. Although I suspect there will always be needs for children born to migrant workers,、um, yeah. whether it be in Hong Kong or in other places. Yeah,、um, it would be great、um, for any、um, of the、um, testator or well, the client who is、um, naming a charitable organization or charity cause as、um, the beneficiary.、Mm. They don't need to pay, uh, donate a hundred percent. They can donate like ten percent、uh, or or twenty、yeah. percent. We have seen cases that a hundred percent will be donated to、um, different. Um, charitable courses.、Um, they could less, like four different charitable courses, and、uh, um, for, to four or the charitable organizations. It's better to have it like this instead、yeah. of like having, for example, no immediate family members to leave to.、Um, a lot of people actually、um, they do not have any children. They don't have any spouse.、Um, parents passed away. Um, they don't need to leave the,、um, the estate, estate to the siblings, or they don't even like the siblings. <laughs> and the only、um, things left would be the charitable cause、mm. to donate whatever that is left behind to benefit someone who are in need,、yeah. instead of benefiting the government. I, I, I'm not. I'm not saying anything against the government <laughs> here, but I think that our government is actually very, very wealthy, wealthy. already. There are some people who are in need that、mm. can benefit more with the limited amount of inheritance. Well, I would also encourage people to consider giving monthly donations to charitable causes. Oh yes, and、um, because again, just in terms of that sustainability of of income, having someone donate, you know, even a small amount, you know, hundred dollars a month, two hundred dollars a month, the cost, you know, cost of a cup of coffee or a lunch. Actually, that can be a game changer for an NGO、um, like Pathfinders because you just have that regular、um, monthly income that you can rely on.、Um, so, you know, again, not even as much as a sort of a legacy、yeah. or will 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 donation, but you know, a regular monthly donation to any charity that 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 you that you support really、um, goes a huge way to give just a little bit of safety、yeah. and security to the NGO as well. Yeah, and don't forget charity. Donation can be used to deduct tax, tax. tax deductibles. <laughs> the part by the secondary <laughs> organisation. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't know whether sort of we have any any questions from from anybody that's、yeah. watching. I hope I hope I hope you've enjoyed the conversation. I'm sorry, I've been so absorbed in that conversation, <laughs> I almost forgot that、well, we, we, <laughs> we <laughs> that we were that we were online. But I, I guess we, we should check. We do have a few questions from the.、Wow. Uh, From the audience,、um, one of the question is, I guess, is for Alfred. If、uh, would the deed of guardianship be enforceable、um, after a family relocates to a third country? Um, this is actually a question that comes across quite often. Um, unfortunately, um, the deed of appointment of guardianship is governed by Hong Kong laws. And、uh, in terms of children's right, I believe that it applies to every country. They have the exclusive jurisdiction. If there is a child with a foreign jurisdiction that are in need of this kind of arrangement, then they have、uh, then the local law will apply.、Okay. So、um, the deed of appointment guardianship may not be as enforceable in other countries compared with Hong Kong because there's not、um, a lot of legal support on it. But it's better to have one instead of not having one. Because of the clarity,、yeah. um, let's say for example, I pass away. I want you to look after my kid. At least, even after we relocate and something happened to me, there is a piece of document to show that you are the person that I want to look after my child, and you can and you can bring the document to a local court if it has to be enforced. It's a very strong evidence to show that you are the person that I, the deceased. Wish, wanted、yeah. or wished 
to look after the children, especially in case someone step someone else step forward and say, "I want to look after children, and I have been building a very strong relationship with children." You can always use this document and say. I'm the designated person. Yeah. Don't fight with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hope that answers the question. Yes. Hope that answers the question. And I can actually, you know what? I also have to um, emphasize the importance of having the parents and the guardian signing a piece of document together. It is actually a. I won't. I won't want to romanticize it, but it's a commitment. Yeah. Um, it's a commitment between. Actually, two friends. A lot of time, especially for the time,、um, temporary guardians,、mm. they are friends,、mm. and it's like it's like a commitment to each other that they will look after each other when they are in need. Well, I guess I, I was I was brought up in the UK,、yeah. and so often when you're baptized or you're christened,、yeah. you, your parents、yeah. will appoint a godfather or godmother. I guess it's the same sort of trust or show of, of or demonstration that that person is is the chosen one、yes. should. Absolutely, without the without the religious without the potato,、um, p- yeah, but p- piece of paper that's signed without the、yeah. religious、uh, connections,、exactly. but without getting wet. Yes, true. <laughs> 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 yes.、Yeah. Um, I guess somewhat there is another question that ties into that.、Um, what to do in case one of the parents is not resident in Hong Kong? Is one of the resident? One of the parents is not resident in Hong Kong. Um. Well, that. In that case, first of all, we have to decide whether、um, who is the who is the parent who has passed away. If it's the non-resident、um, parent who is not、uh, who passed away, is the resident、um, parent still there? And if he or she is still there,、um, the、uh, the guardianship、um, the arrangement will not change. I have to emphasize one thing: that the deed of appointment of guardianship usually only takes the effect after both parents passed away. Okay. It's not like、um, the surviving parent will have to become、um, be a co-parent or have to work with the guardian that you have chosen during the lifetime. If one parent, only one parent, passed away, and a guardian is appointed in such circumstances. In order for that、um, guardians to、um, have the authority to act in the best interest of the child, they need to go to court.、Okay. But only when both parents passed away with the deed of appointment, that would save the guardian from going to court、okay. and establishing the,、um, the relationship or the guardianship.、Yeah. Um, that would actually save a lot of money because、yeah. um, it's very so.、Uh, If there is an application to court, the court first priority is to look after the best interests of the children, and in order to make sure that the guardian is a suitable person to look after the children, the first thing is family visit. Yeah. But don't expect the judge to go to see the family himself、yeah. or himself. Yeah. It would be the、um, social welfare. Yeah. The social welfare officer, who are very experienced in looking after this kind of、um, situation, will be conducting family visit and give the recommendation to the um、uh, to the court. Yeah. And only when the court is satisfied that the arrangement is for the best interest of the children, that an app that an order will be made for the guardianship. But, But that, the time, the time associated with that, and the six sort of, months, nine months, very easy. Yeah, but but again, for the child who's left in this sense of of limbo and stability、exactly. and trauma, exactly,、um, the long term impact of that would be significant.、Exactly. But this is exactly the reason why a deal of permanent guardianship is so important, because during that waiting period, when people are having this. Anxiety. Would an order be、um, in place? Would they make an order?、Um, the social welfare officer is coming. What do we need to prepare?、Yeah. How can we show that we are the best person in the world?、Yeah. Things like yeah, that yeah. that can be saved with one document. Yeah, amazing. Yeah.、Um, we have here another question about、um, how does pathfinders、um, work with employers? Who find themselves in the situation where their、um, domestic um, helper um, is uh, uh, pregnant? 
Yeah, it's very, it's very difficult for, for the employer. There aren't that many options um, currently. So if, if I give um, my example, I'm a, I'm a working mum. I yeah. have a, a seven and eight year old at home. But what do I do if my worker becomes pregnant? Because I would need to be paying her maternity leave yeah. um, if she's worked for me for, for more than four, for 40 weeks. So I'd be paying four fifths of her salary for 14 mm. weeks. The government does subsidise the sort of the last four weeks of that, but the financial stress associated with the maternity uh, payments are, are significant for employers. Mm -hmm. um, and then, if you're a working parent or you have elderly parents and you're working, you would need to look for a temporary yeah. support. Um, the only legal option currently is a local domestic worker, and you, you know, you're talking now around one hundred and thirty dollars an hour. Yeah. Eight hours a day, yeah. five days a week yeah. for fourteen weeks. So yeah. you know, again, that sort of financial stress on mm. on a on a on an employer is very significant. Um, and there's a lack of clarity, really, whether someone has to be living in their employer's home during maternity leave. Oh yes, because it you know, technically question. it's yeah. it's leave, um, but again, the, you know, that's that's not clear. So. In terms of employers, what we're trying to do is to very much um, find solutions. Uh, we're, we're investigating a, you know, potentially an insurance premium that would pay out um, the, the cost of maternity leave. Mm. We're trying to see whether we could figure out a sort of a temporary worker solution, but again, really to give the employer options to maintain their worker so she can continue to access um, services like healthcare um, and to have her 14 weeks maternity leave but without it becoming too um, too challenging for the mm. employer and mm -hmm. trying to make it as neutral for the employer as possible. Mm. We also have employers that are phoning our, our hotline for support. What's very encouraging is that um, since we've done more outreach we're seeing more Cantonese speaking employers reach out to us to oh, ask, ask for our, our advice and also then to sort of help with mediating with their with their worker. So the employer's needs are, are, are very real. Mm -hmm. And yeah. unless we meet the employer's needs and we support the employer yeah. to maintain the job security of the, the yeah. worker, fundamentally it's the child that suffers and they don't get the first start that they need. So really over the last few years, the needs of the employer and solutions for the employer have been a, a key focus for, for Pathfinders. Um, um, would you mind if I ask a very, um, a very real question? Mm. That is, after the delivery of the baby or the domestic worker, um, the domestic worker would very war much want to return to work, mm. but how can they live in and look after a newborn baby, waking up in the middle of the night and feed them and without um, 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 waking up the employer? Yeah, so usually um, what the, the worker would want to do is to... Mm -hmm to live out during mm -hmm. that 14 weeks of, of mm -hmm. maternity leave okay. um, and find other solutions, whether it's staying with, uh, you know, yeah. in a hostel or, or right. even once the baby has received the documentation and the mm. travel documents, returning to their home country. Okay. I mean, I think what's really encouraging for us, we've just launched our 2021 impact report and actually we're seeing many more workers come to us who still have valid visas. And what this means is that they actually can start to go home to give birth to their children and then return to work okay. afterwards. So again, I think there there are different options. Yeah. Um, but really, you know, for an employer, um, you know, a lot of the employers interpret the live-in rule that they have to have their worker live in, even during maternity, sick leave, any kind of leave. But they have no obligation to the child, and so we often see mothers and children in these early days and weeks and months, which are so critical for nurturing care, separated. Yeah. Um, so we just need greater clarity on on this contractual agreement. If the employer says, actually, it's okay during this period, I know where this person is, yeah. that, that that can go ahead. But again, there's lots of anxiety associated with whether that's legal, it's acceptable yeah, or, or not. Yeah, I can imagine. The, um, the, the rules are so, important, are so stiff that actually is not allowed for to um, help domestic helper to live out as yeah. opposed to live in because um, the immigration department will only approve the domestic helper contract after the point satisfying that there is sufficient space for the domestic helper yeah. to live in. But the lack but, of clarity is really around yeah. this, this concept of leave. Yeah. So if you're on holiday but you're in your home country then it's yeah. okay that you're not, yeah. but if you're in Hong Kong and you're taking any kind of leave and you have the agreement of the employer that yeah. you don't, you know, you could be somewhere else. Yeah. Is that okay within the contractual agreement? So that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of interpretation, yes. and I think what we're trying to drive towards is greater clarity. Mm. In this situation, it's okay if mm. this, that, and the other is in place. Mm. Um, so that was a long-winded response yeah. to the question, but yeah, we're trying to I do more. That, to and I think <laughs> the question somewhat ties into the previous one because it's uh, it's about um, 
what kind of prevention programs uh, mm. pathfinders have. So I think partially you, you, yeah, you so talked about it uh, now and partially before. But yeah, I think to prevent a crisis from happening, one, there's the employer support that we've just talked about. The other is really um, empowering um, the, the migrant domestic worker community. Um, we do a lot in terms of outreach and education, but really, again, to try and do Pathfinders out of a job uh, as it does it today, um, we want that, that, that outreach to become very sustainable and scalable. So our approach there is to very much um, uh, educate and professionally train migrant domestic workers um, to do outreach and education mm. on our behalf because that then becomes um, sort of sustainable. And in terms of scale, I mean, we, we launched the program in mid-2019. Um, at the end of 2020, we had 74 ambassadors. Um, today, we have 177. 177? That's yeah. impressive. It's amazing. I mean, the, Christina and the team do a fantastic job. Um, and we're hoping to have 240 by the end of this year, wow. another 300 and I can't remember what the numbers are. For, but again, because the more that the, the, the community can support and serve itself, Hmm. the less need there is for an NGO like Pathfinders to bridge that gap. Um, hmm. And really, we want to be in a position where we're solving some of the issues that we see in society and then identifying other issues where we can kind of um, lend our expertise and support. Hmm. Um, but yeah, the Ambassadors Programme as part of our crisis prevention um, is key because it helps workers understand, you know, what is a love scam? What to be aware of? What are your maternity rights? Uh, what is a love scam? You know, this is when I was saying to that these men that go into the park and basically offer all of these empty promises to a woman and says, "Oh, you know, I love you." And are there predators you, like that out there? Yes, honestly. Oh my God, I'm so honestly, naive. No, honestly. So we there was one guy. We actually had a we had a meeting um, soon after I joined Pathfinders with the the corruption unit at the police force because he was responsible for seven or eight different pregnancies. Oh my God! And he was luring <laughs> he was luring women into his home. Oh God! Um, under the pretense of offering them a job, and so there, there, there are there are all. But again, with those from a legal perspective, that's a he said she said situation. So yeah. it's very hard to prove. But we have all sorts of stories of, of men who have said, oh, I'm a Hong Kong permanent ID and um, we have a relationship and I will marry you. And then as soon as she becomes pregnant, she's there, he's gone. Um, so we just want the women to be much more alert or aware that they shouldn't be so as trusting as many of them are. Um, but it's also difficult. These ladies come to Hong Kong um, and they're lonely. And they're vulnerable. And if they have someone that's sharing them with affection mm. and gifts, and um, they, 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 they fall very quickly into, into relationships that, that just aren't healthy. Oh, so, absolutely. Um, My jaw dropped, literally. Mm. And hearing that there are people like that who are taking advantage of, um, of domestic helper. Oh, absolutely. No, no, that, that's, yeah, that, that, that's, that's, yeah, that, that's mm. a, it's, a, it's a real problem. Mm. Um, and so for us, really empowering these women to be able to sort of prevent that, stop that. Um, mm -hmm. And also think, what does it mean to have a loving relationship? Oh. Um, it's, it's really important to have the, these, these, um, mm. these expectations of a partner yeah. um, that then doesn't sort of abandon you when a pregnancy happens. So, uh, oh. yeah, but our ambassadors are, are, are incredible. Um, yeah, so I think that wraps up our, our webinar today. I hope um, the people who are with us today really enjoy it. And uh, if there's any question, feel free to um, reach out to us. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for taking the time to join us. And donate, donate, donate. <laughs> yes, <laughs> donate, donate. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.